Hello, I'm Linda Johnson, a Methodist local preacher in the Beverly Circuit. Today is Trinity Sunday, when we celebrate the three in one and the one in three of our God. God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit, as first explored in the ancient biblical texts of the Old Testament, right at the beginning of time, when the spirit wind moves over the waters and God speaks creation into being. But before we begin to explore the Trinity and what the concept of a triune God means to us today, let us pray. The word of the Eternal Father created us. The love of the gracious Son redeems us, and the presence of the Holy Spirit unites and empowers us. We worship you, O God, the glorious Trinity, where power, love and peace exist in perfect harmony. For you are the heart of creation, the heart of our being and the heart of our inspiration. From you, by you and through you, we become one in you. Receive us with grace as we worship you. Amen. We continue in worship by singing together the hymn, All Over the World, The Spirit is Moving. Let us confess our wrongdoings to God and know that we are forgiven. Yeah. 
The reading this morning is from Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verses 3. It's taken from the Street Bible by Rob Lacey. Rob is a Christian who tries to present the Bible for today's readers, placing it within a modern context with contemporary language. He wrote the Street Bible because he wants to make the greatest book on earth a page turner, inspiring to new generations who might not understand the more archaic language used in older biblical translations, bringing the whole thing alive in a fresh and, as he says himself, slightly quirky way. Here we go. First off, nothing. No lights, no time, no substance, no matter. Second off, God starts it all up and says, WAP! Stuff everywhere. The cosmos in chaos. No shape, no form, no function, just darkness, total. And floating above it all, God's Holy Spirit, ready for action. Day one. Then God's voice booms out, lights, and from nowhere light floods the skies and night is swept off the scene. God gives it the big thumbs up, calls it day. Day two. God says, I want a dome, call it sky, right there between the waters above and below. And it happens. Day three. God says, too much water. We need something to walk on, a huge lump of it. Call it land. Let the sea lick its edges. God smiles, says, now we've got us some definition. But it's too plain. In its colour, vegetation loads of it, a million shades, now. And the earth goes wild with trees, bushes, plants, flowers and fungi. Now give it a growth permit. Seeds appear in every one. Yes, says God. Day four. We need a schedule. Let's have a sun for the day, a moon for the night. I want seasons, years, and give us stars. Think of a number and a trillion, then times it by the number of trees and we're getting there. We're talking huge. Day five. Okay, animals, amoeba, crustaceans, insects, fish, amphibians, reptiles, Birds, mammals, I want the whole caboodle, teeming with a million varieties of each. And let's have some fun with the shapes, sizes, colours, textures. God tells them all, you've got a growth permit, use it. He sits back, smiles and says, result. Day six. Then God says, let's make people like us, but humans with flesh and blood, skin and bone. Give them the job of caretakers of the vegetation, game wardens of all the animals. So God makes people like him, but human. He makes male and female. For the how, see later. He smiles at them and gives them their job descriptions. Make babies, be parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, fill the earth with your families and run the planet well. You've got all the plants to eat from, so have all the animals. Plenty for all. Enjoy. God looks at everything he's made and says, 
fantastic. I love it. Day seven, job done. The cosmos and the earth complete. God takes a bit of a well-earned R&R and, R and just enjoys. He makes an announcement. Let's keep this day of the week special. A day off. A battery recharge day. Rest day. I must have read the story of creation hundreds of times. We hear it as children at Sunday school and work projects around it. It's included as a principal lectionary reading at least once a year. It's used at creation, harvest and in environmental services and is the source of much discussion amongst theologians, academics, scientists and lay people as to its truth. We all know the first words in the Bible, in the beginning, and we all know that, according to the Bible, the earth was brought into existence by God's word. His word was the Big Bang. But what is very important, especially in the context of today, Trinity Sunday, and something which I've never really paid that much attention to, is the fact that the Spirit was there too, participating, helping, as much a part of creation as God himself or herself. I've just accepted it rather than really thought about it. Here in Genesis, we find reference only to God and the Spirit. But as Christians, we have special regard for the person of Jesus the Christ, on whom our faith is founded, and for the Father, to whom Jesus refers throughout his life and ministry. For there to have been a human part of God, born of a human woman, is an awesome concept especially as he lived amongst us so recently. Because Jesus was divine, then it's our faith which leads us to accept that Jesus' real father was the paternal aspect of God, the third facet of God's Trinitarian nature. You can see why the Hebrews called God Elohim, which is a plural noun and describes more accurately the plurality of God, whereas our noun for God appears to be singular. We talk about him or her, whereas Hebrews always talk of they, reflecting the fact that God is more than just one single unit. I suppose I've always believed that God has different characteristics and that these are evidenced within the Trinity of Father, Son and Spirit, which make up the One. Genesis confirms that God and the Spirit aren't distinct entities. They are interlinked, partners, one and the same, but with different natures, attributes and skill sets. It follows that the Father and the Son are similarly intertwined with the Spirit, separate but part of the whole, with an unfathomably deep relationship. You can understand why theologians have spent so much time and effort trying to communicate this concept to us mortals. Everyone from St Augustine to Karl Barth, alongside every Christian preacher in the world has a theory, some of which are incredibly complicated 
and definitely not for discussion here. Suffice to say that Eastern and Western Christian thinkers still don't agree, despite the fact that the doctrine of the Trinity is a fundamental aspect to the Christian vision of God. Sometimes it's just easier to accept that things are that way, in the same way as we accept that there are three blind mice in the nursery rhyme, three French hens in the Twelve Days of Christmas song, three little pigs in the children's story, or, if you prefer, three billy goats gruff. There are three Bronte sisters, three piece suits, three coarse meals, three wheels on a tricycle, and three leaflets on a shamrock. Three feet in a yard, three sides on a triangle. Three tests Indiana Jones had to pass to reach the Holy Grail. Can you remember what they were? Three primary colours and three parts to a sandwich. I think it's easier to visualise the Trinity in this symbol. God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. He is not just one of those aspects of his nature, but all of them combined in divine quintessence. This multiplicity describes the ultimate will and purpose of God within the three, that of mutual dependence, equality and love. It also means that between the three, every personality trait, emotion, strength, ability, behaviour, value and variable is represented so that every human ever born now and in the future can relate positively to God and to each other. Because, as Genesis tells us, we are born in God's image. So there is nothing new with God. He has every base covered. He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the past and the future, the known and the unknown. He knows every characteristic of our personalities, every trait. So however you express yourself, or decide to live your life is known and recognised within the Trinity without judgement. Whatever your skin colour, eye colour, hair colour, whatever your sex or sexuality, whatever language you speak, skills you have, job you do, educational attainment or any other variable within our humanity are all recognised within the Trinity but, crucially, recognised as equally important. We are all children of God, all equal in his eyes. The coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, not that it had ever been away, but it did this time make its presence felt, meant that things could never be the same again for God's people. The disciples now had the power and the permission to go out into the world and teach people about the kingdom, to show others how to be good and merciful, to have the strength and the language to fight injustice, prejudice and inequality, not through physical conflict, but through the example of Jesus. The techniques they used were those of peaceful protest and non-violent direct action, or NVDA. 
the Trinity itself is one where each component part is equal. Diversity is a given within the Trinity, and therefore any attempt to reject, divide, dominate or belittle anyone in any way can be perceived as unchristian and challenged. There can be no such thing as other in Christianity. We, 7.8 billion people, are as one. The worldwide reaction to the unlawful, brutal killing of George Floyd, a black man, by a white policeman in Minnesota, America, has opened up political and racial divides, which has resulted mainly in worldwide peaceful protest, although there has been civil unrest. The response of the American government to the protests is itself divisive, with its attempt to stifle media coverage and free speech with physical and verbal attacks. The President of the Methodist Conference, the Reverend Dr Barbara Glasson, has made a statement which you can find in full on the Methodist Church website, expressing her deep outrage and sorrow to the murder. In the letter, she apologises that we have not done enough as a church to challenge white privilege and bias or speak out in support of black and ethnic minority communities. She promises that we will be brave speak out and speak up wherever we find racism going forward, including in ourselves. It has also been of concern that inequalities between white and BAME communities have been discovered in the outcomes of people affected by COVID-19. Our black and minority ethnic brothers and sisters have been more likely to contract the coronavirus and die than our white brothers and sisters. Social awareness has always been a feature of Methodism, but we must try harder to root out inequality. There is no one who has ever been born who deserves more respect than the next person. The equilibrium of the Trinity which underpins a Christian's beliefs in equality also underpins that of our enduring relationship with God. In short, an understanding of what the Trinity means and represents can collectively give us hope that, whatever befalls us, we can become more loving giving people. In short, we can become more godlike. The Trinity is, to me, the representation of hope that I can become a better, less judgmental person, sticking up for the marginalised and the needy, fighting against oppressors and challenging greed. I'm with Barbara on this. All my hope on God, the three in one, and one in three, which is love itself, is founded. But what about you? A personal prayer. It's difficult to live with uncertainty. However bad a situation, knowing what you have to face means that you can start coming to terms with it, facing your fears, planning your strategy. When the big picture is too big or too blurred and indistinct, it's easier to focus on small details to try to control what you can. 
the world has changed. How does that affect our living in the meantime? How do I need to change? How do I want to change? Is it possible to live each day as a new opportunity? while knowing that it feels the same as yesterday. I need your help, God, to listen for you in the clamour of voices calling for my attention. To focus on you in the midst of competing priorities. To trust you in this time of uncertainty. Amen. What can I say to you, my God? Shall I collect together all the words that praise your holy name? Shall I give you all the names of this world, you, the unnameable? Shall I call you God of my life? meaning of my existence, hallowing of my acts, my journey's end, bitterness of my bitter hours, home of my loneliness, you, my most treasured happiness. Shall I say, creator, sustainer, partner, near one, distant one, incomprehensible one, God both of flowers and stars, God of the gentle wind and of terrible battles, wisdom, power, loyalty and truthfulness, eternity and infinity, you the all-merciful, you are the just one, you love itself. That was a prayer by Karl Rahner. Now let's join in singing together the hymn, Father, we love you. Now we come to our prayers for others. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we know you grieve with us when we grieve. We know your tears 
are as real as our tears when we suffer loss through illness, through violence, through abuse, through negligence. We pray to you to walk alongside the sick and the suffering. We pray to you to wrap your loving arms around the bereaved and the worried. We pray to you to give mental strength to those who do not know which way to turn because life is so uncertain, so different, so strange. And we pray to you to impart healing to medical staff, carers and ministers. We pray to you to watch over those who risk their own safety to tackle oppression. We pray to you to empower those who face criticism for standing up for equality and understanding. And we pray to you to give wisdom to our leaders as they make decisions to keep their people united as nations, living in peace and harmony with other nations. Amen. And we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us from the Message Bible. Our Father in heaven, Reveal who you are, set the world right, do what's best as above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals, keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. And the benediction for the week ahead. Go in the strength of the Father. Go in the power of Jesus. Go united by the Spirit and know his grace. Amen. To end our worship is In the Beginning, which is the story of creation by Aaron Copeland, sung a cappello by a mezzo-soprano with four accompanying voices. The performance along with the creation images, if you are watching on YouTube, deserves full immersive attention. The file is courtesy music publisher Naxos, so please don't rush to turn off this video. God bless you in the week ahead. <laughs>